Thank you so much for that welcome. Thank you, Brother Hagee. It's a real privilege to be with you again. We've had some exciting times together, I think you'll agree. I esteem Brother Hagee as a great man of God. I think what he's achieved here in this place, in these people, is tremendous. And I'm honored to be here and to minister to you all. So let me turn to an initial text for the theme of warfare in the heavens. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Um, if I may, I'll give you the Prince version which is a little bit more literal. I started learning Greek when I was 10 years old and I became a professor at Cambridge University so I do know something about Greek. Nobody knows everything about Greek, let me tell you that. <clears throat> it's a very elaborate language with a long history of nearly 3,000 years. So anybody who tells you he knows it all is mistaken. But this is the Prince version of Ephesians 6 verse 12. For our wrestling match is not against flesh and blood, and the Living Bible says persons with bodies, which is a good rendering. Our wrestling match is not against persons with bodies, but against rulerships, against authorities, against the world dominators of this present darkness, against spiritual hosts or forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places. So it begins here in my text, where we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Unfortunately, many Christians have got it punctuated wrong. For we do not wrestle, period. <laughs> in fact, I would have to say, from my observations, most Christians have got it wrong. There are not many Christians who are really wrestling. And you know, wrestling is the most intense form of conflict between two persons. A boxing match, there are certain blows you're not allowed to land on the parts of the body. But wrestling, and all-in wrestling as they call it, is total combat. And that's the word that Paul uses here. We are involved in total combat against spiritual forces, persons without bodies, against rulerships, and authorities. I will come back to that phrase later on. Against the world dominators of this present darkness. Against spiritual hosts or forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now we need to ask ourselves how it came about that there are spiritual hosts or forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Let me say first of all that from the first verse of the Bible the word heaven is always plural. In the beginning, God created the heavens plural and the earth singular. So there is more than one heaven. In actual fact, there are three heavens. This is stated very clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 and following. It is doubtless not expedient for me to boast, but I come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So Paul is now speaking about a man who had a very unique vision and revelation. I don't believe that man was Paul. Some people do. I think it wasn't, but that, let's not argue about that. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible or unutterable words, which it is not lawful for a man, or not possible for a man to utter. So Paul is speaking about somebody, a believer, who had a very wonderful experience and he was caught up to the third heaven. Paul says he doesn't know whether his body was caught up with him or just his spirit. But there he was in the third heaven. And he was caught up into paradise and heard unutterable words, which it's not lawful for a man to utter. Now, before I became a believer, I was a professor of logic. And I still believe in logic. 
And my logic tells me if there is a third heaven, there must be a first and a second. You cannot have the third of anything without the first two. And I believe that's the way it is. So in the third heaven, this man heard God himself. He was in paradise. Obviously, this is the highest point where God himself dwells. So the third heaven is the top heaven, if I may put it that way. The first heaven, I believe, to be the visible heaven, the one we look at, the sun, the moon, the stars, and so on. Now, between the first and the third, there must be a second. And that, I believe, is the area where the conflict takes place. I don't believe there's any conflict in the heaven where God dwells. There isn't that kind of conflict on earth, but there is in this intermediate heaven between earth and the throne of God. <clears throat> now, how did this conflict come about? What's its origin? The Bible tells us certain things. It doesn't tell us other things. It's a mistake to try and know, to know more than the Bible tells. But it's really important that we do find out what the Bible has to say. So I'm going to turn now to Isaiah chapter 14. And in my particular translation, the passage I'm looking at begins at verse 12. And it's entitled or headed, The Fall of Lucifer. So these are prophetic words described to a certain angelic being who went who turned in rebellion against God <clears throat> how are you fallen from heaven that's the heaven of God's presence O Lucifer son of the morning how are you cut down to the ground you who weaken the nations now we get the motivation of Lucifer's rebellion let me say of course Lucifer's present name is Satan Satan means the adversary the Greek word, the devil, means the slanderer. So Satan is the adversary of God and man, the slanderer. And remember that anybody who slanders is doing the devil's job. And it, unfortunately, it does occur in churches. Now let's look at the motivation, because this is very important. We learn something extremely helpful for each of us and all of us. For you have said in your heart, this is the motivation of Lucifer's rebellion against God. And five times it starts with the words, I will. So the root of rebellion is the will set in opposition to the will of God. He says, I will ascend into heaven. And he's planning to go higher. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will also sit in the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be like the most high but where the, where the English says like the Hebrew can equally well be translated I will be equal to the most high so the origin of Lucifer's rebellion was personal ambition and pride and I would like to point out to you that is the main source of trouble in the church today it's personal ambition I often ask myself how many ministers in the church are motivated by passion for souls and how many are motivated by personal ambition to have the biggest church the largest mailing list hold the largest meetings and so on and I can tell you from personal experience and observation over a long period of time many sections of the church are riddled with personal ambition in my personal opinion this is the greatest single problem in the church personal ambition in the ministry and we find that its origin was in the heart of Lucifer or Satan himself five times he said his will against the will of God five times he planned to exalt himself I have a little radio series about the whole problem of pride 
which is called the way up is down. If you want to go higher, you have to go lower. It's very interesting because this has been circulated in various countries. It's translated into German. I'm sorry to tell you, good Americans, that on the whole, the response has not been enthusiastic. The thing that surprises me is, in Germany, it's been a bestseller. <laughs> I can't explain it, but we need to take need, heed to that fact. The way up is down. If you want to go higher, you have to go lower. And you see, Satan has implanted this personal ambition, this self-promotion, in the hearts of all who will accept it. <coughs> and that doesn't mean that the church is excluded. In fact, the church is the place where Satan most desires to implant this kind of personal ambition. <coughs> and then it says, yet you should be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. <coughs> it really is true. The way up is down. If you want to go up, go down. The lower down you go, the higher up you end. Don't let Satan deceive you by planting personal ambition in your heart. Because it was his downfall, and it can be your downfall too. Now I want to take a picture <coughs> of the interaction between the heavenlies and the earthly realm an example of what we could call spiritual conflict. I'm going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Now this chapter portrays two persons. The king of Tyre, I'm sorry, the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre. And they are quite different persons. But both of them are involved in the destiny of a very important city in the ancient world called Tyre. And this, this revelation brings out the fact that there is a, an interplay between earthly rulers and heavenly rulers, evil heavenly rulers. And that brings out the fact that one of the most important things we can do <coughs> to change the situation is to deal with the evil heavenly rulers. So now we'll look at a little of what it says in Ezekiel 28, beginning at verse 1, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God. So this is addressed to the prince. <coughs> the second half of the chapter is addressed to the king, who's a totally different person. Because your heart is lifted up, what would, how would you use, what one word would you use to describe that? Pride, that's right. You see, consistently the Bible warns us more against pride than any other problem. Because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seats of God in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. So this prince of Tyre is a human being who claims to be God, as many other human beings have done. Uh, we'll go on. Well, we go there. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself, and gathered gold and silver into your treasures. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up. What's that? Right. Because of what? Your riches. How many people would recognize that wealth is often a source of pride? All these things have very important practical lessons for us. And here is a man, a human ruler, who claims to be God. That's not by any means the only case. In fact, we know there is coming an antichrist who will claim to be God and sit in the temple as God. So these are things that, are, that happen continually throughout history. <clears throat> therefore thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of God, behold therefore I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, 
and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a god? But you shall be a man and not a god in the hand of him who slays you. So here is <coughs> a picture of this human being who is very clever, very wise, very successful, very wealthy, a ruler, but he claims to be a god. And God disp disposes of that claim by sending uh, enemies against him who kill him. And God asks, will you say in the hand of the one who slays you, I am a god and not a man. Now that's the first one. Now we come to a totally different person in the second half of Ezekiel 28. This person is the king of Tyre. <coughs> and it's very clear from much that's said he's not a human being. So we see something that's very important. In the whole spiritual realm there is a relationship between evil forces in the heavenlies and human rulers. And they seek to gain control of human rulers and use them to carry out their purposes. And the same thing is happening right now in the United States of America. So this is not a remote um, story from some other age. This is very relevant to where we are in the United States today. Now I'm going on about the king of Tyre, beginning in verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. That was never true of any human being. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So here is a created being who was in Eden, the garden of God, who walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He's not a man, but he's not God. And then it says in verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. Covers what? Well, this is my belief, covers the throne of God with his wings. So this cherub was outstandingly beautiful, outstandingly wise, and he had a unique position in heaven. He was the cherub who with his wings covered the throne of God. <coughs> now, it's an interesting little footnote. From that time onwards, as far as I can understand, God never put one cherub anywhere. He always put two face to face so that each of them would know there's someone just as beautiful as I am. <laughs> Verse uh, 16, by the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within. Now trading can mean going around selling wares. This is my little picture, I believe, Lucifer went around coveting and obtaining the allegiance of the angels who were under his authority. And I picture him, this is totally imaginary, saying to some of the angels, now you know God doesn't really appreciate you. You're so beautiful and so wise. If I were God, I'd give you a much higher position. Do we ever see people talking like that today? <laughs> And there's very little that's new. Going on in verse, uh, you were perfect in your, in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So he's a created being, he's not God, he's a seraph or a cherub, he's angelic, he's outstanding for his wisdom, his beauty, his power. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Obviously this is not a human being, isn't that true? Now, 
let's go back to the motivation. You see, it's emphasized again and again and again. Your heart was lifted up. What's that? I mean, I cannot say this too often. Undoubtedly, pride is the most common temptation. The thing that most liable to cause us to fall is pride. <coughs> and it didn't start on earth. It started in heaven. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, and so on. Now that's a picture of the situation in Tyre. Tyre has passed away. It's just history. The prince of Tyre died like a man. The king of Tyre never died. He's an angelic being, very proud, very powerful, very wise, full of beauty, and in total opposition to God. Now I'll share with you my own little idea. He said, I will be equal to God. That was what he claimed. Now I believe there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this is simply my impression. I believe God the Father is so awesome, so inimitable, so completely unique, that Lucifer did not aspire to equality with the Father. But there was this beautiful being who represented the Father, the Son. And what I believe myself, Lucifer said, I can be like him. And there started at that point a conflict which has continued ever since between Lucifer and the one who was manifested in human history as Jesus of Nazareth. And really when Jesus came to earth in the form of a man, Lucifer said, now I can get him. And he pursued him, turned the people against him, and obtained his death, and said, now I've got him. But he was wrong. Because the third day, Jesus came forth a total victor. Amen. But the conflict is not yet ended because Satan still fights in every way he can against God, the purposes of God, and the people of God. <coughs> it's suggested, and I'm perfectly prepared to receive it, on the basis of Revelation 12 verse 4, that it was one third of the angels who turned in rebellion with Lucifer against God. It speaks in Revelation 12 of about a great fiery red dragon who is the devil. Revelation 12 verse 3. A great fiery red dragon. Remember, Satan is a dragon, he's also a snake. He can overawe you and overpower you or he can slip in through the drain hole when you don't even know he's there. He's got all sorts of different devices. Anyhow, it says of this dragon, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Other, other interpreters besides me have suggested that this means one third of the angels followed Satan, followed Lucifer in his rebellion against God. Now I want to look for a moment at the structure of the heavenly beings. I want to turn to Colossians. Let me say Ephesians is the epistle about the church of Christ, but Colossians is the epistle about the Christ of the church. And if you're ever dealing with people who've been in a cult, the place to take them to is Colossians. Because it reveals Jesus so uniquely that no guru, no, no other person can ever have anything like what he had. And so we see here in Colossians 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And notice very carefully, he was not created, he was born. 
the only begotten Son of God. And he's the image of God. He himself expresses exactly the person, the nature, the appearance of God. That's why God doesn't want any idols, any images, because he has his own image, and that is Jesus. So he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, should be the firstborn before all creation. He was not created, he was born. Everything after that was created. And then it says, by, for by him all things are created that are in heaven and that are on the earth. Now what guru ever could lay claim to that statement? You understand? It's ridiculous to compare Jesus with any kind of human occult figure or power. <clears throat> all things were created, by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. So there are visible things and there are invisible things. And then it lists the invisible things, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. So there are four main orders in the heavenly realm of the created being. Thrones is the highest, then, and I'm going to give you a more literal translation, dominions or lordships, then principalities or rulerships, and powers or authorities. Let me say that again. Thrones, lordships, rulerships, and authorities. And I say, I put them in the abstract because these are offices, they are positions. It's like we have the word president, it's a man. But if we have the word presidency, it's a function, it's a position. And these are really describing positions rather than individuals. So there are four main orders, thrones, dominions or lordships, rulerships, and authorities. Now, if we go back to Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 12, which is where we started. And I'm, I'm um, doing, giving you the Prince version now. For our wrestling match is not against persons with bodies but against rulerships, against authorities, against the world dominators of this age, against spiritual hosts of weakness in the heaven. Notice the top level is principalities and powers, or rulerships and authorities. So if you go back to Colossians, you'll see the top two levels were not involved in rebellion. Rebellion started at the level of principalities and powers, or rulerships and authorities. So the thrones and the dominions never were alienated from God. But we're still dealing with extremely powerful spiritual beings who are called rulerships or rulers and authorities. That's where we are wrestling, if we are wrestling. How many of you are wrestling? You don't have to answer. But you can't do it without knowing it, that's for sure. Now, I want to go now to a, an incident in the book of Daniel which very vividly demonstrates that there is a mid-heaven between the heaven of God and this earth which is occupied by satanic angels. So if you know where to find Daniel, turn back, comes after, what does it come after? Uh, yeah, now Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. Now this is a lesson on intercession. And it's very, very up to date. Verse 2. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Why was he mourning? For the sad condition of his people. Why could you and I be mourning? for the sad condition of our people. He says, I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. <coughs> that is what we have come to call a Daniel fast. It's not totally abstaining from all food, but it's abstaining from all the things you enjoy the most, such as. 
Enfin. Now I've stopped preaching and I'm meddling with people's business. You know. Uh, a lot of other things. Now, let me tell you this. This is just by the way. When I was saved in 1941, if you can believe people were alive walking the earth as long ago as that. <laughs> I was saved in the British Army and uh, I was totally unspiritual. I didn't know that God spoke to people. But I felt that somebody was saying to me, no chocolate, no chocolate, no chocolate. So I thought, that's ridiculous. Besides, I like chocolate. <laughs> and later on, I was in charge of the canteen in my unit in the desert, and I controlled all the chocolate. <laughs> but later, when I married Ruth, she said to me, you're a chocoholic. She said, I've never eaten, seen anybody eat chocolate the way you do. You eat a whole Toblerone bar in one sitting. See, I became an addict to chocolate. And uh, I'm free now, thank God. But if I only heeded God's warning, it would have saved me a lot of suffering. The strange thing is about the mid, well, we're not in the 20th century now, we're in the 21st. But anyhow, the recent period of 50 or 60 years, something has dropped out of this Christian vocabulary. You know what it is? Self-denial. Up to that time, almost all people, whether Christians or not, assumed that Christians would practice self-denial. But somehow, it just slipped through the cracks. Today, very few people as Christians even think about self-denial. But you know what Jesus said? He said, if you're going to follow me, what's the first step? If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. So Daniel denied himself. Daniel was without any pleasant food for three weeks. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words was like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but great terror fell upon them. So they fled to hide themselves. I remember the people who led me to the Lord were friends of Smith Wigglesworth. I never had direct contact with him. But I remember him saying once, a lady came to him and said, Mr. Smith, Mr. Wigglesworth, do you think I saw an angel? Because I had an experience. And Smith Wigglesworth said, were you frightened? And she said, no. Then he said, then it was not an angel because every time anybody saw an angel in the Bible, they were frightened. So Daniel was, was frightened. And we go on verse 8, Therefore I was left alone, and I saw this great vision. And my strength, no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. You can't come in lower than that. When I'm about to minister anywhere, as for instance here, I always take pains to take time on my face on the floor. Because when you're face on the floor, you can sink no lower. There's only one way you can go after that, that's up. And if I fail to do it, I always tremble that the consequences will display the fact. Anyhow, <coughs> verse 10, Then suddenly a hand touched me, which made me, or set me trembling on my knees and on the palms of my hands. <coughs> and he, this visitor from heaven, said, O Daniel, man greatly beloved. Why was he greatly beloved? I'll tell you why, because I, why I think so. Because he cared enough for his people to fast and pray for them. I the, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. I didn't finish what I was saying about fasting. The year before last, I spoke at a conference of intercessors for America with Bill Bright, whom you know has introduced fasting to many people. And as a matter of interest, I calculated 
how much time I had actually fasted during my Christian life. And I found out it was more than eight years. But not all at one time. <laughs> and I do not consider any of it wasted time. I, wherever I am, I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't practiced fasting. And Jesus said to his disciples, when you fast. He didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. He put it on exactly the same level as giving to charity and praying. Three things, when you pray, when you give alms, and when you fast. And he's a pattern. He didn't have, did have any ministry until he'd spent 40 days fasting. It says in Luke chapter 4, after he was baptized, he went into the desert full of the Holy Spirit. After 40 days fasting, it says he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference. You are full of the Holy Spirit, maybe, but are you moving in the power of the Holy Spirit? It's another question. Anyhow, we're going back to Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set to your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God. To do what? What's the opposite of humility? We're going to do one or the other. Which will it be? Pride is disastrous. Humbling yourself is the way to success. To humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard and I have come because of your words. Now, Daniel had been fasting 21 days. <clears throat> but the first day that he began fasting, the angel was sent with the answer. Why did he take 21 days to get through? Well, it tells you. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, that's no human being. That's a satanic ruler in the heavens. And he had a specific assignment. He was in charge of Persia. Let me say something very exciting has happened to me. I've been invited to speak to 1,000 Iranian Christians in the land of Holland. They're all refugees from Iran. And they tell me that Iran is on the verge of a spiritual explosion. And I'll, I'll just tell you this, I hope it doesn't seem boasting. Our representative in Holland was trying to interest them in me, which is, you know, optional. And uh, <coughs> the man was not interested, the least bit, this Persian man, until our representative showed him the book, Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. He said, did he write that book? And we want him. You know, there are at least four nations whose history has been radically affected by that book. That's Russia, Czechoslovakia, Persia, and one other nation that I forget which. And I want to tell you, <clears throat> if you want to see your nation changed, it will not happen without prayer and fasting. I wrote that book about, oh, more than 20 years ago. I'm, a, I'm an American by choice, you know that? I immigrated to this nation by accident. Not many people immigrated by accident, but I did. Because <laughs> I arrived at the border with my Danish wife and my little black African daughter from Canada in Pembina, North Dakota. And they said, uh, what are you coming for? Well, I said, a visit. I had an invitation from an AOG pastor. Well, they said, how long is the visit? Well, I said, about six months. They said, that's too long for a visit. Well, I have learned not to argue with people like that. So I said, well, maybe you can help us. So you can hardly believe this, but they said, come into Minneapolis and we'll arrange for you to immigrate. That I'm probably the only person who's ever immigrated to the United States by accident. <laughs> and I thank God for this nation. The Christians of America have been extremely good to me. I have a debt. And I think I'm, my way of repaying that debt is writing that book. 
because it demonstrates out of American history the unique place that prayer and fasting had in the birth and origin of this nation and also illustrated by other examples from my personal history in the Middle East and elsewhere where history has been shaped by prayer and fasting and if you want to see the United States turn back to God I don't believe it will happen until people really pray and fast so you have to ask yourself how much does the welfare of my nation mean to me I am deeply grateful to the people of America they've entertained me they've received me they've supported me I will do anything I can to repay that debt but I know the best thing I can do is to tell them the truth about prayer and fasting <clears throat> You know the, the pilgrim, pilgrim fathers, do we call them that? You know, the pilgrims, viewed from British perspective, were a dropout. I mean, they just sailed west and disappeared out of English history. <laughs> when I got here, I was invited to speak at Plymouth, you know, in Massachusetts, on the pilgrims. I didn't know a thing about them. I had to find out. And... Uh, they had, because of religious persecution in England, they fled to Holland and they gathered their whole company, men, women and children, in Leiden, in Holland and they appointed a day of prayer and fasting based on Ezra chapter 8 verse 21 to humble ourselves before the Lord and to seek from him a right way. Then they set out from there, stopped in Plymouth and took the journey to New England. You can say, in a sense, this nation, or this section of this nation, was born out of prayer and fasting. And it was based on the Bible. And I think it's very stupid to turn away from the Bible to human philosophies. I mean, I was a philosopher. I have no respect for human philosophy. It's a waste of time. And I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that because I failed, I was successful. I can hardly believe it, but I wrote a dissertation for King's College Cambridge on this title. The Evolution of Plato's, Plato's Method of Definition. Can you believe it? And I was elected, so I'm, I'm not speaking because I didn't succeed, I did succeed. But when I met the Lord, it all became totally irrelevant to me. So we're back here. <clears throat> Now, it's verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, that's quite a conflict. Three weeks of spiritual conflict in the heavenlies. Because the angel from God was coming with the answer to Daniel's prayer. And the angel of Satan in the heavenlies, in the mid-heaven, was resisting him. <coughs> so, don't underestimate the power of Satan. And then it says, Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, archangels, came to help me. For I've been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, if you read in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Who are the sons of your people? <coughs> when it's addressed to Daniel. Come on, tell me. Who are the sons of your people? The Jews, that's right. It's not a popular word, but there it is. The Jews, they are the sons of Daniel's people. And whenever you see Daniel in the scripture, you know the Jews are center stage in history. Because he stands up for the people for whom he's been given charge by God. And then it goes on to say, I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So one angel couldn't break through. It took two. This angel and Michael. Now I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. <coughs> when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, 
My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. So he went through a very powerful spiritual experience. And not all spiritual experiences are enjoyable. If all you want is enjoyment, you're going to miss out on a lot of things. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly beloved. I like that. O man greatly beloved. That's a message from heaven to Daniel. Fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Verse 20, then he said, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the Prince of Persia. So the battle wasn't over. He'd broken through, but on the way back he had to deal with this satanic angel in the mid-heavens, the Prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, behold, the Prince of Greece will come. The Prince of Greece is not a human being, it's another satanic angel. So we found two countries. Persia and Greece, each of which had a satanic angel put over them to work out Satan's plan for them. Why were they so significant both to God and to Satan? Because the destiny of Israel was being settled there. Now he goes on, and I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael your prince, talking to a Jew, Michael, your prince. So here's a very vivid description of conflict between angels, God's angels and Satan's angels, not on earth, but in the mid heavens. See how real that is? All right. Then it goes on, also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen. Now, Darius was a ruler <coughs> raised up by God to bless Israel. Can you see how Israel is the central theme of all of this? And we see that because of Darius's influence with Israel, he was supported by the angels of God. So this lays bare a whole different scenario from what we're used to. Daniel set it all in motion. It's very important to remember that. Daniel took the initiative. The initiative was not with heaven, it was with earth. Daniel started to pray and fast. That set heaven in motion. God sent an angel with the answer, but the angel was intercepted in the mid-heavens by a satanic angel called the Prince of Persia. And it took the angel plus Michael 21 days to break through. Can you see, when we're talking about wrestling, it's not a little parlor game. It's serious business. If I can leave anything with you, I would like to leave with you the reality of the fact that it's going to take a lot more than most of us are doing to break the power of Satan over this nation. If he can destroy the United States, he will. And I have to say, I hope I say it kindly, the great majority of American Christians are not in touch with reality. They're playing their little religious games, having a nice time in church, and they're totally unaware that a deadly conflict in the spiritual realm is taking place and that the church on earth has a vital function to perform. Our wrestling match is not against persons with bodies, but against rulerships and authority. The world dominators of this present darkness. Dear brothers and sisters, that's not a little assignment. That's not something you teach us in a Sunday school lesson. That demands total commitment. It demands facing the realities of the spiritual situation. It demands coming to grips with selfishness and self-centeredness and self-indulgence and saying away with them. This is too important for my little petty personal interest to interfere with what God wants me to do. 
All right, we've looked at that picture. <coughs> Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. I hope I've succeeded in showing you that there is a real conflict taking place in the heavenly realms. And we've got part to play. It's not going to come to success without our doing our part. Have you grasped that? Say yes or no. Yes. I hope you have. Because if you haven't, I've been wasting my time. Now, let me point out something to you which another preacher pointed out to me just recently. If you read Ephesians, every statement in it is in the plural. There's not one statement to an individual. It's all to you, plural. To you, the church. To you, the believers. This whole scenario does not leave room for the Lone Ranger. He has no part to play in this. It's going to be a corporate action by the people of God or it's not going to work. So we come back to Ephesians 6, going on to verse 13. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. So Paul's picture is taken from the equipment of a Roman legionary what was called his panoply, his full armor, or his full equipment. And he gives it a spiritual application. <coughs> I wish I knew a way to blow my nose without getting it recorded, but it doesn't. <laughs> All right, we are in Ephesians 6, verse 13. <laughs> Therefore, now you've heard the famous prince saying, haven't you? When you find a therefore in the Bible, you want to find out what it's there for. And verse 13 is there because of verse 12. Because we're involved in this life and death conflict with satanic forces in the heavens, take up the whole armor of God. And let me say, this is of most urgent importance for all of you who are involved in spiritual warfare. Don't go into it unarmed. And Paul lists six pieces of armor. And the first five are all weapons of self-defense or equipment. I want to go through them briefly and I want you to check <coughs> how much do you have on. It's verse 14, stand therefore having your waist, having girded your waist with truth. The first piece of equipment is the girdle, the belt. Now you need to understand in those days most often both men and women wore long garments that stretched below the knees. And you'll find a phrase used quite often in the Bible, gird up your loins. Because to do anything active the first thing you had to do was get your long garments up above your knees so that you could freely move your legs. So what you did was you put the girdle on, you pulled the long garment up and you tucked it into your girdle. After that, you were ready for action. Before that, you couldn't go into action. Your long garment would have impeded you. Stand therefore having, your, having girded your waist with truth. I think that's very important. I think it means being ruthlessly honest with ourselves, with other people. The pastor was talking about my first wife, Lydia, and she was a person who told it like it is. Somebody who was reminding me, somebody said to her, how are your children? So she said, do you really want to know? And the man said, yes, well, sit down and I'll tell you. And she went through all eight children, one by the one, and told them exactly. See? In other words, she took the word seriously. She did not use idle speech. She didn't use religious cliches. They're a terrible hindrance if you want to be a real committed Christian. You cannot hide behind religious talk. <coughs> You've got to be sincere. You've got to tell it like it is. 
When I got involved in the 1960s <coughs> with that generation, they were saying, tell it like it is. And I said to myself and my fellow preachers, whatever could we ask better than that? Let's tell it like it is. Let's tell it the way it really is. Let's not mince our words. Let's not paint pretty pictures. Let's really come down and tell them the facts. And I thank God that I saw hundreds of young people radically changed. You know why they got changed? Because they were radical. I was radical a generation before them, but there were no hippies, so I didn't know what to be. <laughs> I tell this story because people sometimes sound incredible, but while I was still at Eton and then at Cambridge, I had the impression that you could make money at roulette if you had the right system. And I thought we'd discover the right system, my friends and I. So I would go to Monte Carlo or Cannes on the south coast of France and play roulette. By a miracle of God's grace, I never really lost anything. Then I discovered later that the man who invented the system, whose name was Labouchere, died a pauper. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you is, living in Monte Carlo, or can, in warm weather, I would walk around in sandals, which was pretty normal. But what was not normal about me was I colored my toenails red. <laughs> I've often said to myself after that, why did I do that? I really don't know, but I think it was a kind of protest. <clears throat> Well, I, I mean, I think it is a protest. You see, why does a girl color her hair blue? Why does she, what motivates her? I don't criticize her. <coughs> I can't cast the first stone. If I colored my toenails red, she's got a right to color her hair blue. But I ask myself, what is it motivating young people to do things like that? And I think it's a wordless protest against the fact that there's something phony. And you know what they think about the church? Many of them think we're phony. And you know what? They're often right, too. I believe, myself, there's a deep hunger in the young people of this generation to get to reality. But it doesn't occur to them to go to the church to find reality. I'll speak about that more on Sunday evening, if I, God wills and we live. But, So we're talking about the girdle. In other words, tell it like it is. Don't use religious cliches. Don't use sweet language. Be like my first wife, and also my second wife, to say the truth. I've never, I've never been married to an insincere woman. I've never been married to one who played a role. They were real. They were what they were. With all their weaknesses and failings, they were real. <clears throat> and that's what I believe is getting up your loins with the girdle of truth. It's getting all this fancy religious talk, <coughs> these religious cliches. When I first became a Pentecostal pastor, which was in Britain, and the slogan of the Pentecostals was, we've got it all. Saved, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Well then, I read the journals of John Wesley, and I said to myself, if we've got it all, what did John Wesley have? Because he had a lot more than we did. <laughs> you see, we had the language. We spoke in tongues. But how far does that get you? It doesn't get you very far. You can just be a freak, a religious freak, and gather with the other freaks every Sunday morning. <laughs> I'm not being malicious, I'm just trying to get you face to face with reality. I thank God I'm in a church now in North Carolina. I really enjoy going to church on Sunday morning. That's unusual. Most often I go because it's a duty. But we got in a church which really tells it like it is, up to a certain point at any rate. And I'm, I'm so much enjoying it. I want reality. I've, I've done how many more years I've lived, I'm going to live, only God knows. But I don't want to, I don't want to fool around. 
To me, time is precious. My strength is precious. I want to use it for the right things. I'm prepared to make sacrifices. You know, I'm going to celebrate my 85th birthday. God helping me, if God wills we live. I'm going to be flying back from Benin, where I'll be going to preach. You know where Benin is? No, you don't. I don't blame you. I didn't either. <coughs> but it's just next west to Nigeria. And there's a conference of French-speaking Africans from all over the, that part of the Africa. And it's like a challenge to me. I want to get my teaching into French. I want to be able to reach the French-speaking world. You know, there are 500 million people who speak French. And they're not being reached, basically. France is a, is a desolate land, spiritually. So, why did I say all that? Because I want to get rid of these long religious garments. I want to tuck them up in the girdle of truth and tell it like it is. Amen. <laughs> Well, we're going on in Ephesians 6, verse 14, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate, what part of the body does it protect above all others? The heart, that's right. So protect your heart with the righteousness, which is not a righteousness of works, but it's a righteousness received by faith in Jesus Christ. And it's a transforming righteousness. It changes you. It brings you into harmony with God. It's not a set of rules. It's a change in your heart that changes everything you think and say and do. How many of you know that's possible? <clears throat> From your own experience. <clears throat> if, you don't ha if you haven't had a life-changing experience, I really question how much of a Christian you are. I don't want to be unkind. You see, you can join a church and stay the same. You can say a prayer and stay the same. You can sign a decision card and stay the same. But you can't meet Jesus and stay the same. <laughs> so, do you have on the breastplate of righteousness. Is your heart protected? Are you a changed person? We're going on, we don't have much longer. Verse 15, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now Roman legionaries had very strong sandals which, with thongs which laced up the, the calf. And they could march long distances forced marches because of their sandals. So your shoes with the preparation of the gospel of peace to me speaks about being available. Being anywhere at any time that God wants you. It's not having a set routine that you have to stick to. It's being adaptable. Also, it's a gospel of peace. So you go to the supermarket to do your shopping, but you've got on the shoes of the gospel. So you meet this precious soul who's in deep trouble and distress, and you do what? You impart peace, see? It isn't so much what you say, it's what you are. It's what you have to give. People are desperately crying out for peace. They long for it and they don't know where to find it. When you contact them, they're not so much interested in your doctrine. They want to know, do you have it? Because if you have it, you can communicate it. And that means being adaptable. You're in the supermarket, you're busy, you've got to shop for all sorts of things and you meet this precious soul who's on the verge of tears and you have to stop and talk to her. And you have to impart peace to her. That means having on the shoes of the gospel, of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Going on, above all, taking the shield of faith, 
with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now the Greek word for shield is directly related to the Greek word for a door because the Roman legionary had a long sort of oval shield which was narrow and it was his protection. And a really trained soldier could so get behind the shield that no part of him was vulnerable. It took training and it took being in condition. And you need it because Satan is going to fire arrows at you which are flaming arrows. They're not just arrows, they're flaming arrows. You want a shield that will stop them. You have to learn how to crouch, how to get down, how to leave no part of your body exposed. That's, that has spiritual application. You have to come to the place where no part of your life is exposed, where you're fully protected. I said to somebody the other day, I said, the shield doesn't protect our luxuries. It just protects our essentials. And I mean, I have nothing against indulging yourself up to a certain point, but remember, it's not protected by the shield. The shield protects you as you are, just a person. <clears throat> and then we're going on taking the helmet of salvation. What part of you does the helmet protect? The mind, that's right. And I suppose the mind is the place where we have the most spiritual battles in all our experience. Is that right? And so we need a protected mind. Now, after I was saved and became a pastor, I had a tremendous con ongoing conflict with depression. And I traced it back later to my father. It was something I inherited from him. I don't want to go into that. Then I discovered that God had provided me with protection. First of all, I was delivered from a spirit, a demon. I was a good Pentecostal preacher, but I was delivered from a demon. Um, what do they call it? The spirit of heaviness was what God called it. And then I thought, now, how do I stay free? And I said, I need to protect my mind. I'm always giving way to negative thoughts and entertaining possibilities that are un... they don't build you up. So I said, I need the helmet. So I found it here, the helmet of salvation. Then I said to myself, well, I am saved. I know I'm saved. Does that mean I have the helmet? Then I said to myself, no, because Paul was writing to Christians who were saved, but he said, take the helmet of salvation. So I said to myself, what is the helmet of salvation? And I make no extra charge for this, but it's priceless. I mean, actually, you cannot put any value on what I'm going to tell you. Well, my Bible had cross-references. And the cross-reference was to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. And it absolutely kindled something within me. I said, my problem is pessimism. My shield is hope. I've got to cultivate scriptural optimism all the time. And I had an ongoing battle because the devil tried to put back depression. And every time he did, I had to thrust at him with the sword, tell him to stay his distance. I had to have a scripture that would answer every suggestion that things were not the way they should be. And really what got me out of it mostly was Romans 8, 24. All things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. So I would say to myself, do I love God? Yes. Am I called? Yes. Then whatever happens is working good for me. Can you believe that? It's very, very important. I've passed through a tremendous personal crisis in the last two years with the past passing of my wife. And I would not have survived if I had not believed Romans 8, 24. No matter what happens, the question is, not is God working it together for good, but am I walking in God's purpose? And I said, yes, I am. I believe I'm doing what God has called me to do. I believe I'm in my calling. 
I don't enjoy it. It's painful. But nevertheless, it's doing me good. Because God works all things together for good. If you can believe that, you'll never be depressed again. And I, make, I don't make no extra charge for that. But I mean, I'm giving you advice which will save you a lot of time with a psychiatrist. <coughs> and I notice, I don't know whether you've noticed the same thing, that depression is becoming more and more common. Have you noticed that? People talk about depression today in ways I never heard when I was a boy. I mean, people are actually hospitalized with depression. We need to have protection. It's there. It's the helmet. <coughs> Going on, uh, where are we? Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, it's very up to date now to point out that that word there means a spoken word, rhema. So the sword of the Spirit is not the Bible on your bookshelf or even on your nightstand. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God when you take it and quote it to the devil. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't use any other weapon. Three times when Satan tempted him, he answered what? It is written. It is written. It is written. And the devil has no answer when you quote the written word of God. He backs off. So that's the sword of the Spirit. <clears throat> now all those, except the last, are really weapons of defense. It's only with that that you pass into the realm of attack. But even that, your sword will only reach as far as your arm reaches. You still have nothing to reach out. And there are only six pieces of armor. And when you've got six good things in the Bible, you can be absolutely sure there is a seventh. Where is the seventh? It's in verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. What Charles Wesley called the weapon of all prayer. <clears throat> and that is our intercontinental ballistic missile. It'll reach anywhere at any time with amazing accuracy. So that's a list of the armor. Let me just go through it again. The girdle of truth the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, praying always. That's the ultimate weapon, is all prayer. <clears throat> I just want to take one simple example from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4. The apostles had been told by the religious and the civil authorities not ever to teach or preach again in the name of Jesus. You see how smart they were? Because there is no salvation in any other name but the name of Jesus. If you can't use the name of Jesus, you can't offer salvation. The gospel has no meaning. And they were forbidden by the authorities over them, the religious and the civil authorities, not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. What did they do? <clears throat> it says in verse in Acts 4:23, being let go, they went to their own com companions. <clears throat> it's good to have your own companions, isn't it? Don't be a lone ranger. And reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. That's the weapon of all prayer. It's all God's people praying together with one accord. And it changed the whole situation. The way it was open for them to continue to preach the gospel. But that was a major crisis in the development of the church. If they hadn't won the victory, then the church could have gone no further. If they were not free to use the name of Jesus. So this is how the church overcomes strategic opposition from Satan. When there is a closed door, when there is a closed nation, when there's a closed group, how can we break through with the weapon of all prayer? 
And I believe that's what we need today in America. It's the weapon of all prayer. Now, I just want to give you a picture of the, the climax, the victory. Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Verse 10, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Why does he accuse us? What does he want to make us? In one word? Guilty, that's right. We have to learn to deal with guilt. And they overcame him. They, the believers on earth, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So how do we overcome him? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. In other words, we testify to what the word of God says the blood of Jesus does for us. Can I say that again? We testify personally to what the word of God says the blood of Jesus does for us. And you have to know what the Word of God says. You have to testify. It's when it comes out of your mouth that it has power. You can believe it all you like, but it doesn't until you speak it that it works. They, the believers on earth, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And let me find out just one thing. From the example of the Passover, you know the story was that they had to kill the lamb, gather its blood in a basin, and that was protection available. But it didn't protect anybody. They had to transfer the blood from the basin to the place where they were living. And what they used was a little bunch of a herb that grows everywhere in the Middle East called hyssop. They dipped the hyssop in the blood struck it against the lintel and the doorpost, and they were protected. Now, to apply this analogy, the blood is in the basin. Jesus has shed his blood. But the blood in the basin doesn't protect you. You've got to get it to where you live. How do you get it there? What's the hyssop? The word of your testimony. It's when you testify personally to what the Word of God says, the blood of Jesus does, that you're sprinkling the blood where it protects you. <coughs> Amen. Now, I think I'll lead you in a little proclamation, which is on one of our cards. But uh, I think it would be good if you were to stand to your feet. You sat a long while, you've been wonderfully patient, and standing is an attitude of... <coughs> victory. <clears throat> so I'm going to make the proclamation that I make several times a day. I take the hyssop and I sprinkle it wherever I am. I'll say it once through and then we'll say it together, okay? And this is the end. This is what I say. My body is a temple. All right, okay, if you're going to then, that's fine. Start again. My body is a temple. For the, Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit, redeemed, redeemed cleansed, cleansed, and sanctified, and sanctified by, the blood of Jesus. by the blood of Jesus. How do I go on? <laughs> the devil has no place in me, no, no, place in no power over me, no, no unsettled claims against me. No All has been settled by the blood of Jesus. I overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony and that's not the end uh, hold on and I do not love my life to the death say that again how will you express that in one word self-denial is a good one but I would say commitment and you see uncommitted Christians and use the blood as much as they like, it doesn't do anything. You have to be committed. You have to be willing to lay your life down. How willing are you? I was preaching on this the other day, and I said something which rather surprised me, but I, I'm prepared to say it again. 
And this is my personal testimony. For me, it is more important to do the word of God, to do the will of God, than to live, to stay alive. So, I'm not asking you to say that. But that's what is commitment, see. The, the devil is not the least bit afraid of uncommitted Christians. We can go through all our religious activities and motions and sing and do whatever we do. But it's only when you come to the place where you don't love your life to the death that your testimony has supernatural power. Amen. Shall we say that once more and then you, you're released. You've been wonderful. And now I have to remember what I say. My body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. Redeemed, cleansed, and sanctified by the blood of Jesus. My members, the parts of my body, are instruments of righteousness, yielded to God for his service and for his glory. The devil has no place in me, no power over me, no unsettled claims against me. All has been settled by the blood of Jesus. I overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony and I do not love my life to the death. My body is for the Lord and the Lord is for my body. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Last night, if I remember rightly, and my memory is getting a bit overfilled, we um, dealt with spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. I can't go back over that, but tonight we're going to go further and we're going to deal with spiritual warfare on earth. And primarily, the persons with whom we make warfare on earth are demons or evil spirits and that's what we're going to talk about in a basic and practical way tonight but I think it would be appropriate for me to begin with a brief up-to-date personal testimony in September of last year I was living with one of my married daughters my only Arab daughter in the UK and I went for a medical checkup and was referred to a, what they call in England, a consultant, the top medical rank, and I was diagnosed with cancer of the bladder. This was a very thorough diagnose, diagnosis with a cystoscopy, an internal inspection, and furthermore they told me it was a dangerous form of cancer because it was liable to spread to other parts of the body. Well, I was not afraid I felt somehow that God was in control and I was living with my, my, one of my married daughters as I said and she had a friend, the family had a friend who was a curate. Now I don't think most Americans know what a curate is. A curate is about the lowest rung of the officialdom of the, um, what do you call it, Anglican church, what do you call it here? The, Episcopal Church, thank you. So I was with my in my daughter's house and we had a phone call from a young man, a curate in the Anglican Church, young enough to be my grandson. And he said, I would like to come and pray for you. May I come? So of course I said, yes, you're welcome. He was a little timid. He sat at the opposite end of the living room. And after a while I said to him, now I want you to understand I'm not necessarily expecting that if you pray for me, I'll instantly be totally healed of cancer. But come and pray anyhow. So he came, I was sitting in a chair, he stood beside me, put his hand on my shoulder, and began to pray. And it was like, I can only say like cats fighting inside my chest. I have never experienced such intense conflict within me. And I let out a loud, prolonged, sustained roar. Not just a shout, it was a roar. And at that moment, I knew that I had been delivered from a demon of cancer. Amen. 
Now, about six months later, as far as I know, there is no evidence of cancer anywhere in my body. So I want to encourage you, it pays to get delivered from demons. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be fearful. Just accept what God has for you. Now I want to turn to the pattern of the ministry of Jesus in this particular aspect of deliverance from evil spirits. And I want to read from Mark chapter 1 a description of the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Beginning at verse 21. Mark 1, 21. Then they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. The Greek says, in an unclean spirit. And I want to suggest to you that that man had probably been attending the synagogue like a good religious Jew for many, many, many years. But it says, and he, and if you read it carefully, it's not the man, it's the spirit. He cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now it's a remarkable fact that the demon in the man immediately knew who Jesus was. It took his disciples about 12 months to discover what the demon already knew. So we're dealing with people with supernatural knowledge. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet. The, the Greek says, be muzzled and come out of him. Now Jesus was not speaking to the man. He was speaking to the demon in the man. It's very important to see that. There comes a point when we don't deal with people, we deal with the demons in people, whether they're in us or in other people. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. You see, you have two persons. He, the demon, came out of him, the man. So there was more than one person there. There was the man and there was the person of the demon or the evil spirit in the man. And Jesus did not deal with the man. He dealt with the demon in the man. And he was not embarrassed. Now, if that kind of behavior took place in some churches, including Pentecostal churches. You know what they do? They'd lead the man out and put him in the basement and let one of the deacons take care of him. And I'm not theorizing, I've seen that happen. Thank God we don't have to take the man out of the church, we have to take the demon out of the man and let the man stay in the church. Then it says they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, what, saying, what is this, a new doctrine? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. I want to point out to you that Jesus was not first acknowledged as the Son of God or the Messiah. What first attracted people to him was he had power to deal with demons and that caused his reputation to go all around that whole area. And then we read a little further on in verse 32 to 34. Now at evening when the sun had set they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. Now demon possessed is a bad translation and I'm really upset with the NIV which in many ways has modernized English that they've gone back to this old-fashioned religious language demon possessed and I'll tell you why I object to it because the word possessed suggests ownership. If you're demon possessed then you're owned by a demon. Now I don't believe that any born-again sincere Christian can be owned by a demon. I do not believe any sincere born-again Christian can be demon-possessed. But the Greek word that's used can easily be and should be translated demonized. And I do believe that many born-again Christians are still demonized. That is, there are areas in their personality where the Holy Spirit is not yet in complete control. There's a demon that has to be dealt with. 
And Jesus did it. They brought to him all who were sick and those who were demonized. And notice, they didn't really come for, heal for, for deliverance, they came for healing. But in receiving healing, many of them needed deliverance from demons. And then it goes on, when he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak or to say that they knew him. You see, the demons all knew who Jesus was. And he cast out many demons. How many of you have cast out many demons? I don't ask for a demonstration, I just want to... How far are we up to the standard of Jesus? How far are we below the standard and the pattern of Jesus? You say, well, they were not Christians. That's true, they were Jews. But actually they were living basically by the law of Moses. And in most cases they were living much more righteous lives than most of the people in the United States today. They, the penalty for adultery was death. If that penalty were imposed on the American population today, we'd lose about a quarter of our people immediately. Is that right? I'm not exaggerating, am I? So don't say, well, those were people that didn't know righteousness. Many people say, well, I'm sure there are people who need to be delivered from demons, but they're in prisons or they're in lunatic asylums. That's not true. Demons actually can be very comfortable in many churches. And then we go on in Mark chapter 1 verse 39. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout, throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. He did two things. He preached and he cast out demons. He didn't just preach. He preached and he dealt with the people's problems. Now when God brought me into this ministry for quite a while, for two or three years at least, I was doing exactly that all around America. I was preaching and casting out demons. And I was not embarrassed because I can't improve on Jesus. The best I can do is to do as much as he did. So I want you to understand this is a regular part of the Christian ministry. It's a regular part of the ministry of Jesus. It's not something extreme or fanatical. It's just doing what Jesus did the way he did it. Let's look for also in, Mark, in Luke 13 for a moment, verses 31 and 32. On that very day, some Pharisees came to Jesus, saying, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he, Jesus, said to them, Go tell that fox, that's Herod. He was not really too polite in some respects. Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. In other words, Jesus said, all through my earthly ministry I'm going to do two things. I'm going to cast out demons and I'm going to heal the sick. He started that way, he continued that way, and he concluded that way. That is the pattern of the earthly ministry of Jesus. I personally have no ambition to improve on it. If I can do even small part of what he did, I'll be satisfied. Now, there's a very important significance about this particular ministry of casting out demons. If you read the Old Testament, I think you'll find that almost all the miracles that were performed in the new were performed in the old. They raised the dead, they healed the sick, they fed multitudes. But there's one thing they never did. They never cast out demons. You cannot find an example of it anywhere in the Old Testament. And in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28, Jesus said, And if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So his casting out of demons was a distinctive sign that the kingdom of God had come. It was a miracle that was not performed, as far as we know, in the Old Testament. It's a distinctive declaration the kingdom of God has come. And really the casting out demons is war between two kingdoms. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus demonstrated the victory of the kingdom of God by casting out demons. 
Now, let's read the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8. We don't, can't go into the background, we don't have time. But he said this, As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So Jesus said, you've got to do four things. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That was part of their total ministry. Everywhere they went. Now you say, Brother Prince, have you seen the dead raised? The answer is yes, I have. In East Africa, when I was principal of a college for training African teachers, two of my students died and were raised from the dead. And they each gave a very interesting testimony of what happened to their spirit while it was out of their body and what happened when the spirit returned to their body. I just say that because some people say, well, people don't raise the dead. The answer is people do raise the dead. They don't raise all the dead. But they raise the dead when it's God's purpose that the dead should be raised. All right, so let's take those instructions once more. <laughs> Verses 7 and 8. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. However, it is not enough to preach. You have to demonstrate the validity of what you're preaching. So Jesus says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Four things. One of them is casting out demons and then in Mark 16 at the end of the gospel record Jesus gave final dis instructions after his resurrection to all who were to go out and preach the gospel <clears throat> Mark 16 beginning at verse 15 <coughs> he said to them go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. <coughs> and these signs will follow or accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Let's stop there. How many have heard about speaking with new tongues? Everybody here. It's a very popular subject. But how many have heard about casting out demons? How many have seen it practiced? Pray, praise God, you're a rather an exceptional congregation. But I want to point out, the first supernatural sign was not speaking with tongues, it was casting out demons. You see, we have kind of gaps in our theology and our practice. We do some of the things and not others. But the way Jesus told us to do it is the right way. Now let's consider how they obeyed during the earthly ministry of Jesus in Luke chapter 10 verses 17 through 20 he had sent out 70 or 72 to prepare the way before him then they returned with joy saying Lord even the demons are subject to us in your name that was the thing that excited them most. You see, that was the new thing. Healing was not new. Miraculous provision was not new. But to have authority over demons in the name of Jesus, that was exciting. And Jesus said to them, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now I want to emphasize that here tonight because we're going to go into action later on Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Do not get frightened. Demons have no power against a true believer who understands his right. And then one of the most interesting examples is in Acts chapter 8. How many of you know that there's only one person in the New Testament who's actually called an evangelist? Do you know that? Do you know who he is? Philip, that's right. He's the only person who is actually designated an evangelist. And his ministry is described in Acts chapter 8. <coughs> Therefore, you can say his ministry is the pattern ministry of the evangelist. And it says in Acts 8 verse 5, Then Philip went down to a city of Samaria 
and preach Christ to them. I'm so glad he didn't have complicated theology. He preached Christ. An evangelist message is very simple. In Samaria he preached Christ. When he met the eunuch later on the road to Gaza he preached Jesus. That's an evangelist message. Christ, Jesus. And the multitudes with one accord he did the things spoken by Philip hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, Philip didn't have a committee. He didn't have a sponsoring church. He didn't have an auditorium. He didn't have a trained choir. I mean, all those things are good, but they're not essential. What's essential is preach the gospel with signs following. And you will always get a crowd. You don't have to invest in all the expense of an auditorium or a choir or all that. I had a young friend, an African friend in East Africa who was an evangelist and he said, Brother Prince, there's no problem about getting a, a crowd in, in, in Africa. He said, I walk into a village and ask how many sick people are in the village. They bring them, I pray for them, they're healed and I get my crowd. He said, I don't have to do anything more. <laughs> that is New Testament evangelism. I'm not criticizing other ways of doing it, but they're more elaborate and they're more expensive. Am I? All right, we're going on then. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ or the Messiah to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, he did the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. What attracted the crowd? In one word, Miracles, that's right. Miracles are not optional. They're not accessories. They're an essential part of the ministry of evangelism. And I, I emphasize again, there's only one person actually titled an evangelist in the whole New Testament. It's Philip. If he isn't a pattern, we don't have a pattern. Now what kind of miracles happen? Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were it says possessed, but that's wrong, who were demonized. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So that is the ministry of the evangelist. It's to preach Christ, the Messiah. It's to preach Jesus, a message attested by supernatural signs, healing the sick, and casting out demons, and you'll get your crowd. I mean, that's, it never fails. You may get opposition, too. But that's part of the whole package deal. But I want you to notice that they did not maintain an atmosphere of solemn dignity in their meetings. I grew up in the Anglican Church, and I, I mean, there are many things I respect in the Anglican Church, but you kind of tiptoed into church. You sat down quietly, you didn't raise your voice, nobody did anything very unusual, it was all very sedate and nicely ordered. And all those people that came in in their nice Sunday costumes, they said these beautiful words. I mean, the Anglican prayer book has got some of the most beautiful spiritual words. But as a boy watching them and listening to what they said, as they walked out of church, I asked myself, did they really believe what they were saying? I couldn't answer the question. I remember thinking to myself, you know, this dignified lady here, if she dropped her lace handkerchief and I ran after her and picked it up, she'd be more excited about getting her handkerchief back than she was about all the things she said in the liturgy. So I just want to find out there's dignity and dignity. There's religious, religious dignity which is often a cover-up for demons. I mean, I was in a I was in a meeting, and this grieves me tremendously, I was in a meeting of a very well-known American evangelist. If I gave you her name, everybody would know it. She was, to some extent, a little, a little while a friend of mine. But in one of her meetings, a black woman began to demonstrate very clearly demon activity. And you know what they did? Two men came, caught her by the arms, and carried her out. And that's all they did. That's a tragedy. She desperately needed the ministry of the evangelist. But she, the evangelist, was afraid it would upset her reputation. 
people wouldn't come to her meetings. I think she was wrong. I think more people would have come, actually. I respect her. She's with the Lord now. But it always main, remained in my memory. This desperate black woman crying out for help, couldn't contain herself, and was dumped. That's all they did with her. They just put her out. When I dealt with a demon in one woman in a church, one of the church ladies came up to me and said, Brother Prince, you know what they'd have done in most churches? They would have said, our sister needs help. Will one of the deacons take her down to the basement? <laughs> That's not the biblical solution. She needs help, but not in the basement. <laughs> now, I want to just give you a brief description of what demons are as I understand it. My understanding is limited, uh, but I'll give you the best I have. I think the best thing to say is that they are persons without bodies. Demons have real personality. They have distinctive personalities. One demon is not exactly like another. I remember something so vivid. I was dealing with a man. His wife had come to me and said, Brother Prince, my husband needs deliverance. And I made a mistake. I prayed for him on the basis of what his wife asked, you see. I never have done that again. If he needs deliverance, let him tell me he needs deliverance. When I started to pray for the man and he started to get violent. And his wife drew me aside and said, Brother Prince, at home he throws chairs at me. So I said, well, why didn't you tell me that before we started? <laughs> Anyhow, the demons were speaking out of the man and one of them said, I'm unclean. And I thought, now, I don't want to embarrass the man in front of his wife. I could think of all sorts of unclean things that might be the problem. But I said, you, you spirit of unclean thoughts, come out of the man. He said, that's not my name. <laughs> I said, come out anyhow. He said, that's not my name. I mean, you can't easily understand how much of an individual a demon is. It wanted to be recognized by the right name. Well, eventually it came out, but the last thing it said before it came out was, that's not my name. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to impress upon you the fact we're dealing with real persons with characteristic attributes. I've already pointed out, but I'll say again, two things. First of all, the word is not devil. The word devil comes from the Greek word diabolos, which means a slanderer, and is a title of Satan himself. The things we are dealing with are daimonions, demons, and they are not devils. They are another kind of being. Where do they come from? Well, I don't believe anybody has an absolutely authoritative answer. In my thinking, the most probable explanation is they are disembodied spirits of a pre-Adamic race that perished under the judgment of God between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. I'm glad to discover that our pastor more or less thinks the same. Am I right? Good, thank you. That's encouraging. I mean, we may be wrong, but that's the best that I can come up with. But the most distinctive fact about demons is they desperately crave to occupy a body. They are not satisfied until they get inside a body. Preferably they would occupy the body of a man or a woman. But rather than be disembodied, they would rather go into the body of pigs. Because you remember the man of Gadara, the demons said, send us into the pigs. We don't want to be disembodied. What they didn't realize was that going into the pigs would cause the death of the pigs and they were left after that with the same problem again. But what I'm trying to deal with is you're dealing with a person who hasn't got a body and desperately craves to be in a body because, as I believe, only through a body can they exercise their ungodly lusts. If it's a demon of alcohol, it has to have a human throat through which to consume. If it's a demon of sexual immorality, 
It has to have sexual organs through which it can operate. If it's a demon of hatred, it has to have emotions that it can play upon to work through. In other words, we are surrounded by an invisible host of persons without bodies desperately craving to occupy bodies <coughs> and desperately struggling not to be out of bodies. Now, I think I need to say a little bit briefly how I became involved. I did not volunteer for this ministry. <laughs> I was conscripted. First of all, when I became a pastor of a very small Pentecostal congregation in West London in the early 1950s, I had a serious ongoing problem with depression. I know none of you have ever struggled with depression, but be patient with me, I did. And it threatened to destroy my ministry because I had this continual sense, I'm a failure, I won't succeed, I can't do it. And I struggled and struggled. I did not know the answer, but I was directed to a passage in Isaiah, <coughs> chapter 61. What I thank God for is I always had the Bible, and I always turned to the Bible, and I always accepted the Bible as authoritative and final. That has protected me and preserved me through many different problems and situations. But it's this famous passage which Jesus quoted in the synagogue in Nazareth. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And as I was reading that passage, God showed me that's your problem. It's a spirit of heaviness, a spirit of grief, an unhappy spirit. And let me tell you, the, the protection is a garment of praise. When you wear a garment of praise, that spirit cannot have access to you. But I had grown up I can't go into all my background, but I have exposed myself in many ways to demons. And there was the spirit of heaviness. Then God brought to me the passage in Joel chapter 2 verse 32, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And so in my desperation, all alone, I called on the name of the Lord. I said, Lord, deliver me from this spirit of heaviness. And something stirred inside me, in my chest. I let out a kind of mixture of a sob and a groan. And I felt something like a dark cloud lifting from me. And I realized I had been delivered from a spirit of heaviness or a spirit of mourning or a spirit of grief. But that didn't immediately plunge me into the public ministry. It was later on when I was in Seattle, Washington, pastoring another small Pentecostal church and I was involved with, a lot with the full gospel businessmen. One day a Baptist pastor phoned me and he said, Brother Prince, I have a woman in my congregation who needs deliverance from demons. Well, I wasn't used, used to Baptist pastors saying things like that. But what he said after that was still more astonishing. He said, God has shown me that you and your wife are to be the instruments of her deliverance. Well, I don't let people's revelation dictate to me, so I sent a quick telegram up to heaven. What, what about it? And I got the answer, well, this is from me. So I said, all right. I made an appointment, bring the wo woman, and we'll do our best. Well, we chose, we chose a Saturday morning, and at that time I just become friends with a Presbyterian couple who had just been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And while we were waiting for the Baptist lady to come, the Presbyterian couple turned up. So we said, well, you might as well stay. We don't know what's going to happen, but it could be exciting. <laughs> well, 
along comes the Baptist pastor with this lady who had been the secretary of the church at one time. She was aged about 35, I would say. She was a perfectly normal American housewife. I scanned her from every angle. I couldn't see anything strange about her. No metallic tone in her voice, no fire in her eyes, just an ordinary Baptist, good Baptist. So, but the pastor was convinced. So he sat her down in the chair and he said, now she's already been delivered from a demon of nicotine. I thought she has. And, but he said there are others. So he stood in front of her and started to shout at the demons. Well, I learned by experience later that you don't get any more power by shouting. Demons are not deaf. <laughs> Even spirits of deafness are not deaf. You don't need to shout and it's wasting energy. Anyhow, he stood there and shouted at this demon, I command you to come out and nothing seemed to happen. Then he said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out. And the woman's face changed. A different expression came over her face. Well, he stood there quite a long while and didn't get any further. So he stepped back and I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So I stood in front of the woman and I had all the theology. I said, now you spirit that's in this woman, I'm speaking to you and not to the woman. What is your name? And it wouldn't answer. So I said, I command you in the name of Jesus to answer. What is your name? And we went on like this for a while and suddenly it answered. But before it answered, she changed. She crossed her hands over her throat and started to throttle herself. And I had this Presbyterian brother who was taller and heavier than I am. It took our united strength to pull her arms away from her throat. Well then, we got past that stage and suddenly the demon responded, my name is hate. And when it said hate, every feature of the woman's face registered the most unutterable hatred. I'd never seen such pure hatred in anybody's eyes. So I said, you demon of hate, come out of this woman. And this gruff, masculine voice answered out of the woman, I'm not coming out. This is my house. I've lived here 35 years and I'm not coming out. Well, I checked everything with the Bible, mentally. I thought, that's right. Jesus said, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, it goes through dry places seeking rest. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I went out. So that's scriptural. So we, I beat it down with the name of Jesus and with scripture. And suddenly it came out with a loud, prolonged roar. And as it came out, the woman slumped forward, relaxed, and this tension in me subsided. I knew it had gone. But the demon had said before it came out, even if I come out, my brothers are here and they'll kill her. So I knew there were more than one demon. So anyhow, we went through this. It must have lasted two or three hours. And about seven or eight different spirits came out. One that really impressed me was self-pity. And I began to understand some of the ways people respond that are not natural. The last spirit that came out was a spirit of death. And again, I checked. I thought, is this scriptural? I thought death is a physical condition. But then I remembered in Revelation chapter 6, there was a rider on a horse whose name was death. So death can be a person. Well, when the spirit of death came out, this woman was stretched out on her back on the floor absolutely limp, her face was totally pale, there was no color, her skin was, was cold. If you had come in and looked at her, you would have said there's a dead person on the floor. Well, she lay there for about 10 minutes and put her arms up in the air and started to speak in tongues. Now, one of the things the demons had said, I had said, how did you come into this woman? And it said, that is death. I said, when did you come into this woman? It said, three and a half years ago, when she nearly died on the operating table. So I stored all this up. Well, then the woman was apparently delivered. So I delivered her back to the Baptist pastor and he drove her off. About halfway through the week, the woman phoned Lydia and me and said, 
I think they're trying to come back. Can you come and help me? So we drove out to the home, talked with the woman, and I diagnosed that it was fear, that she was afraid they would come back and this was opening the door. But while we were there, she had a little daughter of six who was a shy, thin, rather unhappy looking little girl. And everywhere we walked, she walked with us. But every time I looked at her, she averted her eyes. She would not look me in the eyes. So I said to the mother, you know, I think your daughter has some of the same problems you have. But she said, will you pray for her? I said, by all means. So the next Saturday morning, we had the daughter there. And basically, we went through much of the same with the daughter as with the mother. Most of the same spirits that were in the, door, in the mother came out of the daughter. Not all of them, but hate was one and death was one. And when the death came out of the little girl, she was stretched flat on, the, on her back on the floor, looking like a dead person. So I, I checked on them for about two years. Apparently they remained free. The little girl had been graded retarded. She became a normal, happy, healthy little girl. Well then, gradually, by stages, the Lord launched me into a ministry of mass deliverance. And I've conducted ministries of that kind in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in Turkey, in New Zealand, in Australia, in at least a dozen nations. And I discovered that you can do it en masse. I'm not saying it's the best way, but when the needs are so desperate, you have to do what you can. And I've learned to instruct people, help them to identify their problem, show them how to be delivered, and pray for them, and they will be delivered. Now, I want to answer some of the common questions. How do they come in? And my answer is usually through a moment or a place of weakness. The devil searches for the weak moment or the weak place to come in. Now, what are the moments or places of weakness? This is not an exhaustive list, but it will give you some understanding. First of all, prenatal. Many infants are born with a demon in them. And it happens because of something that the mother did or didn't do. And the greatest single problem that exposes children to demons, unborn children, is involvement in the occult. And I want to say, you cannot get involved in the occult in any form without being exposed to demons. There was a proverb that used to say, he, he who sups with the devil needs a spoon with a long handle. I want to tell you there is no spoon made with a handle long enough to make it safe to sup, sup with the devil. And I want to read from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18 in the NIV because the language is more up to date. This is what God says about the occult. That is involvement with any kind of spirits that aren't spirits from God. Uh, it's, it's written to to Israel before they entered the land. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 9. When you enter the land your, the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire. So the first kind of person is those who actually make their own children living sacrifices, presenting them in a furnace to the God Molech. And I want you to understand, it's very important, all the other practices that follow are in the same category with offering your infant as a sacrifice to Molech. God doesn't put any distinction. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery. You know what divination is? Fortune telling. It's trying to discern something supernaturally by a spirit that is not from God. Every fortune teller is a diviner. If you've ever been to a fortune teller, you've been exposed to a spirit of divination. 
I remember dealing with a woman who needed spirit, deliverance from the spirit of divination. She said, I can't understand how it ever came into me. But I discovered that in the newspaper she regularly read the horoscope pages. That's all you need to do. None of you I know ever did that. Who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, which is rampant in the United States today, from the top of the nation downward, from the White House downward, witchcraft is rampant. Or who casts spells, or is a medium, or a spiritist, or consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Anyone who does any of those things is detestable. If you go to a fortune teller, that's detestable. God puts it in the same category with people who offer their infants in sacrifices to, a, to, a, to an evil God. You might say, well, what's wrong with the occult? I'll try to explain it this way. When you get involved in the occult, you're making friends with God's enemies. And God takes note of that. And you have to repent and you have to cancel any involvement if you want help from God. So that's, uh, let me give you an example, a, remark, a remarkable example that happened fairly recently. A woman, a very fine Christian woman, came to me with real grief. She said, we've just had a letter from my son who's at college telling us that he's been homosexual from the womb, that he was born a homosexual. So I began to talk to her and I said, uh, when you were pregnant with your son, did you do anything that's occult? Well, she said, yes. I tried to divine whether it was male or female, boy or girl. I had a pendulum suspended in front of my womb and I knew if it went one way it was a boy and went another way it was a girl. I said to her, you exposed your unborn son to a demon by what you did. That's why he's homosexual from birth. Now she's a very solid Christian woman. She understood, she repented, and I believe in due course her prayers will bring deliverance to her son. But let that be a warning to you. You cannot fool around with the occult in any form or shape. And if you want a further definition of the occult, it's in my book. I have another very common demon that enters unborn children is the demon of rejection. Um, see, every little baby comes into the world craving one thing more than anything else, which is what? Love, that's right. But you see, the mother has got too many children, she hasn't got enough income, she discovers she's pregnant, and she regrets it. She doesn't have to say anything. She just says, I wish I didn't, wasn't going to have this baby. That baby is born with a spirit of rejection. Now this is true of my second wife, Ruth. She was born in the height of the Depression in 1930. She was the eighth child and her mother was already struggling to feed the seven previous children. And without saying anything, the mother resented having another mouth to feed. And Ruth had to be delivered from a spirit of rejection. Thank God we knew what to do and she was wonderfully delivered. But rejection is one of the commonest demons and it enters very frequently while a person is still in his mother's womb. <clears throat> then there are pressures in early childhood. James chapter 3 and verse 16 says this. James 3:16. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. So in a strife-torn, disharmonious home, the children, born or unborn, are automatically exposed to demons. And most children do not have strong enough defenses to keep the demons out. So any child born in an unhappy, strife-torn, divided home, is exposed to demons. How many such homes are there in the United States today? There are many, aren't there? 
See, parents are responsible to maintain an atmosphere in their homes in which the children can grow up free from demonic molestation. But very few parents in contemporary America are doing it. That's one reason why I wrote my book, Husbands and Fathers. Because the number one failure in American culture is the husband and the father. And everything ultimately revolves around him. It's wonderful what wives and mothers can do, but no wife and mother is a substitute for a father. And the greatest single need of America today is men who are real fathers. Amen? amen. Come on, you ladies, you say amen. That's right. Now, I have been married to two wonderful women. I am not a woman hater, never was and never will be. And I admire women. In fact, I'm jealous for women. I want the best for them. I hate to see them pr prostituting themselves to the world. I have high standards for women. I know what a woman can be. Now, Bill, please don't mis misunderstand me. When I say we need fathers, I'm not saying we don't need mothers. But that we have more good mothers than we have good fathers today. But Many, many children in contemporary America are exposed to demons in early childhood and most of them do not have the spiritual defenses to keep them out. Then there's what I call emotional shock or continued emotional pressure. Um, I remember a woman telling me once she needed to be delivered from a spirit of fear. I said, how did it enter? Well, she said, I was standing on the sidewalk and a terrible accident happened in front of me. And at that moment, I was seized with fear and I realized the demon of fear entered me. Now, let me give you a scripture about that. In 1 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 6. This is speaking about Christian women. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So to be a daughter of, of Sarah, you have to be not afraid with any terror. You have not to give way to sudden emotional shock. But if you do, it's very possible that a demon will enter. Then, Another way that come, they come, which is obvious, is sinful acts or habits. If you continually indulge in a sinful act, repeating it, sooner or later, and maybe sooner than later, the demon of that act will enter you. If you continually in, give way to sinful habits or foolish habits. <laughs> I was praying in a church once and... A woman came up to me and there were several other people around them. She said, whatever she said, I said, I think you have a demon of criticism. She said, you want me to cast it out? She said, yes. I said, you demon of criticism, come out. Well, about three people all around started to get delivered at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> criticism is a sinful habit and can expose you to demons. Let me talk about one that nobody talks about in church. So because people don't talk about it in church, churchgoers have to go to a psychiatrist for help. But I'm talking about masturbation. Now some people say masturbation is natural, it's not evil. I don't agree, but you're free to have your opinion. But what I do know is there are masses and masses of people who regularly masturbate and hate themselves for doing it. And they say never again, and a little while later they're doing the same thing again. Now that is a demon. It's a demon of masturbation. And because I don't want to embarrass you later, I'll tell you how it will come out. It will come out of your hands and your fingers. And you feel this tingling in your fingers. And your fingers will begin to go stiff and maybe bend backwards. I've seen this happen many times. A person will come up to his brother and say, I don't say what, understand what's happening to me. My fingers are tingling and they're bending back. <coughs> I say, you have a demon of masturbation. Hate it. And get rid of it. And I want to tell you, masturbation will not go out unless you hate it. You have to really hate it. 
But you might say, I'm a married man and happily married. Thank God you are. But I have cast a demon of masturbation out of a man of 50 who was married. But he still was a slave to masturbation. And let me speak to you frankly for a moment. What happens when a married partner has masturbation demon is the satisfaction from the sexual act that the other person should get goes to the demon and not to the person. Can you understand what I'm saying? I hope you can. I'm trying to be frank without offensive. And then there's another very, very common way that demons entered, enter, and that is through idle words. And I want to read to you what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12 about idle words. Verse 36. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. People often say, well, I didn't really mean it. That's exactly what Jesus says. That's an idle word. Any words you speak you don't really mean are idle. And whether you intend it or not one day, unless you repent, you're going to have a, give account for them in the day of judgment. Every idle word. People so often say to me, well, Brother Prince, I didn't really mean it. I said, that's precisely what it is. It's an idle word. It's a word you didn't mean. And I cannot tell you how many people I've dealt with who have a spirit of death because they invited it in. They got depressed or discouraged and they said, well, I might as well be dead. What's the use of living? I'd be better off dead. That's all you have to say. The demon of death is right there in front of you. It will enter many times. I'm not saying always. So that's how they come in. I'm just going to repeat it. That's not everything. Number one, prenatal. An attitude in the mother that makes the baby feel unwelcome. Pressures in early childhood. Children that grow up in strife-torn homes are automatically exposed to demons. Emotional shock or sustained emotional pressure. Sinful acts or habits and idle words. Now that's not a comprehensive list but it gives you some idea of the way that demons come in. Now I want to list characteristic activities of demons. Number one, demons entice. They entice us to do evil. They entice us to sin. Take an example. You're walking along the street and somebody's drunk their billfold full of money. And a voice says to you, an, an, an inaudible voice says, pick it up. You might as well. If it was yours, they would do it. Why don't you? Well, anything that can speak is a person. And behind that inaudible voice is a person. And that person is enticing you to do evil. You may not follow it, you may resist. But nevertheless, that demon is there trying to get you to do something which will expose you to him. Then demons harass. And the example I always think of is this businessman who's had a terrible day in the office. The air conditioning failed, his secretary did the wrong thing, he had a client who was complaining and threatening to sue him. When he makes it through the day, he gets into his car to drive home and there's an accident on the freeway. And he sits there for one hour without air conditioning on the freeway, stewing. And I mean, he's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. He gets home and what happens? His wife is late with the supper, the kids are running around screaming, and as they say in America, he blows his stack. And at that moment, the demon of anger enters him. You see, it's been following him around all day, just waiting for that moment of weakness to come in. And after that, he's a different person. He still loves his wife and children dearly, but from time to time, something comes over him that causes him to do things that harm those he loves the most. And from time to time when his wife looks into his eyes, she sees something that was never there before. What has happened? The demon of anger followed him all day and chose the weakest moment and the weakest place and jumped in. Demons defile. They're dirty. They're all called unclean. They make you feel unclean. They fill your mind with dirty, unclean attitudes, emotions, and thoughts. 
particularly if you're planning to read your Bible or worship. Anything that attacks you at a moment like that is probably a demon. And you, you never feel really pure. You can sing about the blood of Jesus, how wonderful it is, but there's something in you that doesn't respond. Demons defile. Demons torture. Jesus says in Matthew 18, the, the one who will not forgive his brother or his sister, what's the sentence? Deliver him to what? To the torturer. Says. That means you and me. If we don't forgive, if we retain bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, <coughs> the sentence of Jesus is deliver him to the torturers. Who are the torturers? Demons. Very simple. They torture in many ways. They torture emotionally. They torture with fear, with guilt, with uh, some kind of uneasy feeling that you haven't done the right thing, but you can never put your finger on it. They torture you physically. I've dealt with many people who've been delivered from a spirit of arthritis. To me, if you look at arthritis, that's demonic. It twists, it tortures, it incapacitates. Now, please understand, I am not saying that everybody who has arthritis has a demon, but many do. I recall a scene in South Africa some years ago when Ruth and I were ministering together. We were praying for the sick, and a person, I think it was a woman, came up with arthritis. And I said to her, I, I want you to know I'm going to deal with this as a demon. Is that okay? She said, yes. Ruth and I prayed, cast the demon out, and she was delivered. Well, then I thought to myself, why go through this process with everybody individually? Because everybody had seen and heard it. So I said, I believe that you can be delivered from the spirit of arthritis without being individually prayed for. So anybody, and it was a large congregation, anybody who needs deliverance from arthritis, will you stand up? Well, about 30 people stood up in different places. I played a spirit commanding the spirit of arthritis to leave them. Now I said to the people, don't sit down until you know you've been delivered. And we went on ministering, but after about half an hour, every one of those people had sat down. Later on, Ruth and I traveled in various parts of South Africa. We met several people who had been the ones that stood up and sat down, and they each testified they'd been healed. Now please understand, I'm not saying all arthritis is demonic. But I, if you want to get a real picture of what demons are like, arthritis is a pretty good picture. They torment, they torture, they incapacitate, they bind. They are evil things. And uh, again, this, there are exceptions, but it's surprising how many people who suffer from arthritis have some kind of bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness in their life. I need not say no more. Please don't get offended if you have arthritis. It doesn't mean you have a demon, but if you do have a demon, get rid of it. <coughs> then number five, demons compel. They make you do things you don't really want to do. I would say almost any act or habit that is compulsive is probably demonic, not necessarily. Demons also enslave. They make you slaves. Take the demon of alcohol. It enslaves you. You just cannot do without your glass of whiskey. You know it is harmful. You don't really enjoy it. But you can't help yourself. But people can be enslaved by other things. They can be enslaved by television. You know that. You can be an addict to television. Some television addicts walk into a room. The first thing they do, switch on the television. They don't know what programs are, they don't know what to watch, but it's, they're just as compulsive as a person who reaches for a glass of whiskey and drinks it. Now, put compulsion and enslaving together, you get addiction. And our contemporary culture is full of addictions. And I would say 99.9% .9 of them are demonic. <clears throat> Let me give you a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is, <coughs> for me, the biblical definition 
of addiction. Verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. I would prefer to say beneficial. So all things are lawful. I'm not on any law which says thou shalt not eat and thou shalt not do this and that. But not everything is beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the stomach, and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So overeating and sexual immorality are specifically mentioned by Paul as possible examples of addictions. And an addict is a slave. And I'm sorry to say the church is full of addicts. Not all of them are addicts, but there are many, many good Christians who are nevertheless slaves. Slaves of masturbation. Slaves of idle talk. Slaves of defiling habits. Slaves of wrong attitudes. Slaves of wrong eating and drinking. I have come to see that my body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. And I'm responsible for how I treat that temple. I am not free to defile it. I'm not free to do anything that would make it less good than it should be. I am very careful about what I eat and what I drink. I'm not under any law, but I try to honor God's temple. How about you? Are you taking care of your temple? If it were a physical material temple, you'd be very careful about it, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd keep it swept. You'd keep the windows clean. You wouldn't let dust accumulate. You wouldn't let the toilet get clogged. What about your physical temple? How well are you maintaining that? Let me say this, and it's just, I make no extra charge for it. I came to the United States in the 1960s and I, I have myself, this is my personal subjective impression, there have been three strong men, one after the other, over this nation that have sought to dominate it. The first was rebellion. In the 1960s there was an upsurge of rebellion. Well the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Whenever people get into rebellion, they'll get into the occult. So the next demonic force was witchcraft. But in my personal subjective judgment, those are in the past. They're still very active. But the number one strong man seeking to dominate the United States today is self-indulgence. And whereas both witchcraft and rebellion were regarded as wrong by the church, self-indulgence is practiced by the church. Now you can just keep loving me anyhow. But somebody said a little while ago to me, they said, if you want to know the best restaurant in the town, ask a preacher. And it's true. I mean, it is absolutely true. Preachers do know the best restaurant. Well, I'll go a little further. About 1990, I was diagnosed with a serious physical condition. <clears throat> and I prayed many times to God. I said, God, I don't understand. I believe in healing. I preach healing. But I'm not healed. I've seen many people healed. I'm not healed. Well, God didn't give me a definite answer, <clears throat> but he gave me a little overview of the way I had been living in previous years. And he never said a thing, he never made a comment, but he just showed me in various situations, and you, where, you know where most of them were? In restaurants. <clears throat> and I saw that I had been a slave to self-indulgence. In, in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, Paul says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of 
of love and of self-discipline. That's the NIV translation. Everybody wants power. Everybody wants love. How many people want self-discipline? You see, the Holy Spirit will not discipline you unless you discipline yourself. He won't take over and do the job for you. But if you make your mind up, he'll help you. I mourn over people very close to me who are slaves of their stomachs. Strange silence, isn't there? And they're destroying themselves. And they're defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit. Oh. And I'm, like somebody said, now he's left off preaching and he's meddling with other people's business. <coughs> what about coffee? Coffee is a drug. I mean, everybody knows that. Now, I'm not saying you're an addict, but I'm saying do this. Just stop drinking coffee for 48 hours and see if you're addicted or not. You'll find out. If you come through and it's fine, all right. But if you cannot do without it, then you need to do without it. Paul said, all things are lawful but I will not be brought under the power of anything. And really, where it boils down to for modern America is eating and drinking. That's where we have to say, am I under the power of anything? And many, many good American Christians are slaves of their stomachs, to call it by the right name. And it's an addiction, and it's demonic. I'm not saying necessarily you need to be delivered from a demon, but check and see. And mind you, you won't be delivered if you want to keep on doing it. All right. <clears throat> the final thing that demons do is they make weak or sick. And almost every form of sickness can be demonic. I'm not saying it is, but it can be caused by a demon. As I've said, arthritis is a very conspicuous example. Migraine is another conspicuous example. Almost anything that's torturing is demonic, I would say. Torturing and enslaving. All right, now we come to the big question. Let me say something else about sickness. You know, I, I do sometimes pray for people check their legs. How many of you have seen me do that? Anybody here? That's all right. Okay, and very often when I hold a person's leg and it grows out, the person will start to contort and twist and behave in a very strange way. And I've learned that it's a spirit of crippling. And I've seen many people delivered from a crippling spirit, something that twists, deforms, enslaves. In fact, I think I was on the way to being, having that problem myself if I hadn't met a good chiropractor. <laughs> I'm willing to take help from anybody that can help me. And I thank God for chiropractors, I thank God for doctors, I'm not against doctors. But the best one of all, his name is Jesus. Jesus. That's right. <clears throat> Now we're coming to the practical questions. And here are the steps for receiving deliverance. Step number one, personally affirm your faith in Christ. The scripture says Christ is the high priest of our confession. It's our confession that releases his high priestly ministry. If we make no confession, he cannot serve as our high priest. He is the high priest of our confession. When we say the same about ourselves as God says in his word, we release the high priestly ministry of Jesus on our behalf. <clears throat> Step number two, humble yourself. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I have not found anywhere in the Bible where God says he will humble us. Always God says you do it. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. 
Humility is a decision. And in this, in this ministry of deliverance, you may well have to make a decision between your dignity and your deliverance. And if your dignity is more important to you, you probably won't get delivered. People who are getting delivered are sometimes very undignified. But my advice to you is let dignity go and receive deliverance. As after you've received deliverance, dignity will come back. I want to point out to you something very, very beautiful out of the scripture. There was one person whom God gave a unique honor, never given to any other person. That was to be the first human witness of the resurrection of Jesus. And you know who she was? Mary Magdalene. And you know what it says about her? In Mark 16, I want you to notice this. Mark 16 verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. It all goes in the same passage. So she was not inferior because she'd been delivered by, from seven demons. In fact, she's the first human witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus had such compassion on her broken heart that he wouldn't even go to the Father until he'd revealed himself to her. To me, that's one of the most marvelous illustrations of the compassion of Jesus. There was one woman so broken hearted, so much in love with him, that he couldn't even leave earth till he'd revealed himself to her. Who was it? Mary Magdalene. What was her testimony? He delivered me out of seven demons. Brothers and sisters, don't be ashamed if you should need deliverance. You could be ashamed if you let pride keep you from receiving deliverance. Number one was personally affirm your faith in Christ. Number two, humble yourself. Number three, confess any known sin. Don't search for sin, but if the Holy Spirit shows you an unconfessed sin, <coughs> confess it. I, would, I think you'll find this is true. God has never committed himself to, con to forgive sins that we are not willing to confess. So you, if you want forgiveness, you have to be prepared to confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But only if we confess our sin. Now you're not confessing in order to tell something God he doesn't know. Because God knows all about your sins long before you confess them. What you're doing is bringing something dark out into the light. Because as I understand it, the blood of Jesus does not cleanse in the dark. You have to bring it to the light with all its embarrassment. But when you bring it to the light, the blood is applied and you are cleansed. Whiter than snow. It's worth it. And listen, we're not talking about confessing our sins to me or to the pastor. Just confessing your sins to the Lord. And after all, you're not going to be telling him anything he doesn't already know. Because he knows all about it. But he still loves you. But it's his condition that you bring it out into the open. Repent of all sins. It's not enough to, re to confess, you have to repent. The Bible says in Proverbs, he who covers his sins will not prosper. <coughs> if you keep it covered, you will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes his sin will have mercy. So you have to confess and then you have to forsake. You may have to throw it away. Whatever it is, you may have to throw it away. It may be expensive, but you may have to throw it away. Forgive all other people. Now this is absolutely essential. If you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. That's the only comment Jesus made at the end of teaching the Lord's Prayer. If you forgive sins, God will forgive you. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. You have to make, your, um, make up your mind. And let me say forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a decision. You carry in your hand IOUs from somebody to you. Maybe for 
who knows, $10,000. But God in his hand has IOUs from you to him for a thousand, hundred thousand dollars. God says, let's make a deal. You tear up your IOUs and I'll tear up mine. But if you don't tear yours up, I'll hold on to mine. I was teaching this years ago in Florida. The end of the session, a very smartly dressed young woman of about 30 walked right up the aisle to me, stood right in front of me, said, Mr. Prince, I just want to tell you, I've got rid of about $30,000 worth of IOUs, turned round and walked out. She got the message. I, mean, I didn't have to consult her or counsel her. She had got the message. So you may have to tear up some IOUs. I've discovered that the two commonest causes why people are not delivered is number one, unforgiveness, and number two, failure to repent. So you have to do it. Then you have to break with the occult and all false religion. That's essential. And you may have to get rid of occult objects that are in your house. Because God told Moses, if you bring them into your house, any accursed object, you'll become accursed like the thing. Some of you got things in your house that bring a curse on you. Objects related to the occult. Objects of superstition. Get rid of them. Have a house cleaning. Let me tell you my own experience. My grandfather was the officer in the British Army who suppressed what was called the Boxer Rebellion in China. You may not know about it, but there was an uprising of the Chinese nationalists around about 1900 and something. And the British sent out an expeditionary force under the command of my grandfather that suppressed it. I'm not saying it should have been suppressed, but that's what they did. Well, my grandfather returned with some rather costly Chinese antiques. And in due course, they were passed through my mother to me. And amongst them were four beautiful embroidered Chinese dragons. I mean, they were beautiful. And furthermore, they had five claws. And a dragon with five claws is an imperial dragon. So I had them framed and put up on the wall in my living room. But when I began to deal with deliverance, the Lord had an interview with me. He said, now, tell me, in the Bible, who is represented by a dragon? Well, I didn't have to be a theologian, I said, the devil. He said, do you think it's appropriate that you as a preacher would have on the walls of your living, living room something that demonstrates or advertises or portrays the devil. I got the message, so I got rid of them. And I want to tell you this, I didn't change what I was doing. My ministry was exactly the same. I was a traveling Bible teacher, but in the next year, my income doubled. <laughs> that is speaking a language you can understand. Do you understand that? It wouldn't have doubled if I hadn't taken away the hindrance, the barrier to God's blessing. So get rid of anything occult. Let me say one of the most dangerous and subtle forms of the occult is Freemasonry. If you have any relative or you yourself have in any way been involved in Freemasonry, break it off totally, absolutely. Terminate it, get it out of the house. Don't do, maintain any connection with it. Some of the most terrible cases of demonization I've seen have been associated with Freemasonry. Forgive all other people. Break with the occult and all false religions. And God warned Moses, he said, if you bring any of those satanic objects into your home, you become a curse like them. Prepare to be released from every curse over your life. We're going to deal with that without going into it. Jesus was made a curse on the cross. That was the last thing that happened to him, that we might be redeemed from every curse and enter into the blessing of Abraham, whom God blessed in all things. <coughs> there is another book that I have out there called Blessing or Curse, You Can Choose. <coughs> I think it's the most, if I may say this, the most unique revelation God has given me. Other people speak about casting out demons. I don't know of any other book that deals systematically or thoroughly with the issue of curses. 
Many, many people in America and Britain and Europe today don't believe in curses. They think they're superstitious. Believe me, if you go to Africa or Asia, they know curses are real. They're just as real here, but they're dressed up in nice pretty clothes. So you can be released from a curse. Why? Because on the cross, Jesus was made a curse. That's the only basis of release. Take your stand with God. Come out on God's side. Say, God, I'm your child. I'm your servant. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. I hate anything that comes between you and me. I don't want it. I'm for you. And number nine, expel. Now that's very, very important. That's why I titled my book, They Shall Expel Demons. Because expel is not a religious word. I was looking for some word that wasn't religious. It's, it's in a certain translation of the New Testament. So what is expel? You've got something inside you that you don't want. What do you do? You expel it. You breathe it out. You blow it out. You sob it out, you cough it out, you scream it out, but you get it out. You don't keep it inside you. Now I saw this in a marvelous illustration somewhere near Washington DC, a good many years ago. A mother brought to me <coughs> her four-year-old son. She said, will you pray for him? I said, what's his allergy? What I said, what's his problem? She said, allergies. I said, what kind of allergies? She said, food allergies. I said, what's he allergic to? She said, tell me what he isn't allergic to. Well, I said, I'm going to deal with this as an evil spirit. Are you prepared? She said, yes. So then I sat the little boy down and I talked to him in very simple language. I said, there's a bad spirit, a breath inside you that keeps you from eating the things you really like. I'm going to command that spirit to come out in the name of Jesus. I want you to blow it out. Well, he was like a little soldier. I mean, everything was just military. I went through it all. I said, now, come out, you spirit. Now I said, blow it out. And he blew out four times. No emotion, nothing. Well, I didn't know what had happened. So I said, well, that's the best I can do. So off he went with his mother. About three days later, the mother was back. She said, pray for me. I said, what are your problems? She said, allergies. <laughs> I said, first of all, tell me what happened to your son. Well, she said, he marched back home with me, marched up to the refrigerator, took out everything he enjoyed, ate it all, and nothing did him any harm. <laughs> you see, this is so simple that religious people can't always do it, but expel it. I had a letter once from a woman years ago. She said, Brother Prince, Never hesitate to tell people to breathe it out. She said, my husband went to one of your meetings, went up to the front, prayed like you told, blew, blew out four times, and that's all that happened. But she said he's been a different man ever since. This is very real, see, it's not up there. It's right down here on the surface of earth. So on my pages 216 and 217, I have the prayer for deliverance. So I want you to consider for a few moments what I've been saying. Open your heart and mind to the Lord and say to him, Lord, is there anything in me that I need to get rid of? Because I want it out. <laughs>